that the prophets did not bequeath gold or silver coins yani they didn't bequeath money walakin warathu al-ilm but they bequeath knowledge faman akhadha faqad akhadha min hadhan wafir so whoever takes from this inheritance that sure that they have taken a great portion at one time sayyidna abu huraira the greatest narrator of the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he came into the souk and into the marketplace and he called out and he said that the inheritance of the messenger of Allah is being passed out and a large number of people followed him and they came to the mosque and they saw some people remembering Allah other people were reciting the Quran other people studying and they said that I thought you said that the inheritance of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is being passed out he said this is the inheritance of the prophet this is what he left behind and it is from the beauty of our deen is that that this is the true dawla this is the true that government in that sense is that these majalis that are preserving the inheritance of rasulullah such that in many times in history that even nowadays as well as that we find that this is something even without a political entity is entirely preserved and upheld and entirely intact and such that it's it's subsisting in and of itself and that it allows other people to uh, expose themselves to subsistence as well and that once we tie our hearts into that meaning that it opens up a new understanding that we can have of the the importance of what we should really be doing with our time and that that when we expose ourselves to beneficial knowledge that it reinvigorates our heart with with meanings we have a couple other introductory measures that we need to discuss but one of the things by way of introduction we wanted to discuss is Imam Ghazali has a, a, a chapter in his book at Maqsad al-Asna. We quoted this book yesterday and it's translated as the highest aim. That this is the best book that I know of that's available in English and it's been uh, printed by the Islamic Text Society and it's titled that Al-Ghazali the 99 beautiful names of God which the real name is Al-Maqsad al-Asna. There was a previous translation Uh, as well but this one is a, a better translation and it's very accessible the translators there's two translators that for the most part did a good job there's a few things that could have been done better but for the most part it's accessible and Imam Ghazali as is customary that before he gets into the names that he has several introductory chapters because that he wants to deal with many of the he wants to deal with the framework before he actually gets into the names such that while he's explaining a particular name that a thought might might won't come to someone's mind like wait a sec i thought that you know how could that be he wants to get that all of get that out of the way and this is why that imam ghazali is in a sense that even though he's from pre-modern times he's modern in that sense that he he wants to deal and we give you intellectual clarity before that you actually get into the subject matter which for many people is actually very important there's certain people that are like that that are very analytical by their nature that even translates into outward habits as well is that they'll come to their desk space and they find it dirty that they find very difficult they find a difficult time actually getting work done until they organize their desk space that likewise internally many people and especially people that have uh, are from the west or raised in the west is that oftentimes that you have to deal with a lot of the mental framework and that for these analytical minds so that, that when you actually approach the subject topic that there's no misunderstandings that arise so one of these issues that arises is that the names that are of apparently are apparently similar in meaning that can different names of Allah ta'ala be synonymous or not so this is an issue that Imam Ghazali deals with now if we had more time i would actually like to read through this whole thing because that it shows you a, it's a beautiful case study of the maturity of our scholars and the way that they dealt with legal issues and you'll find this throughout the books of the fuqaha the jurists and the usuliyun and others is that when they approach a topic that a lot of the deen that is not definitive meaning that many of the discussions rather not a lot of the deen rather we'll say the following that many of the scholarly discussions in the traditional books are not definitive and that they'll explore an issue and say it seems like this is the right answer 
and leave it at that. Sometimes they'll explore two different possibilities and they won't make tarjih. They won't say that this is the correct opinion and this is not the correct opinion. And that, you know, there is a tendency and, and, and some of the scholars criticize the later tendency of some of the later scholars of always focusing on that what was the strongest of the two to the detriment and the exclusion of the other opinion. Okay, whether it be, again, in usul or fiqh or logha or whatever it might be. And this is really interesting because is that one of the things that we have to recognize is that the things that are definitively known from the deen, about which there is no disagreement, that yakfu jahiduha, the one who that disbelieves them, is outside the fold of Islam, are actually very few. That the vast majority of issues that are from the realm of probability, and this is where this, this is the scholarly job. This is the job of the scholar, is to analyze it and to, you know, see. Is this, pos- is this possible or is this not possible and so forth. So Imam al-Ghazali does this here. And what he says about the possibility of the names, two names indicating the same meaning, he says, I consider this highly unlikely. Okay, so he doesn't say that, you know, this is completely ridiculous. He says he considers this highly unlikely. And the reason is because that a name is not intended for its letters but for its meaning. That when you give someone a name, the reason you're giving someone or something a name is because you want to designate something and you want to know and differentiate that particular thing from something else. And so that, that the merit of a name is with the meanings that underlie that very name. So this is what he says, and that oftentimes you'll see them as well fluctuate between scriptural proofs, yani that are based upon the Quran and the Sunnah, and rational proofs. And oftentimes, if it's depending upon the subject matter, they also get into the linguistic proofs as well. And that he goes on to say is that, but especially in terms of the 99 names, because that, that Allah Ta'ala, that our Prophet informed us particularly about them, man ahsaha, whoever enumerates them. So, in particular, when it pertains to the 99 names, that he says that one of two things we have to look at. Either that it could be that, that they're outside of the 99 names. Okay, so that, they're, that the second thing is, though, is that, that he says that you have to look at the ones that appear to be synonymous. In reality, if you look closer, that they're actually different. And one of the examples that he mentions is, is that Allah Ta'ala's name is, one of his names is Al-Ghafir. Okay, that Ghafir Al-Ghafir is to forgive. Allah is Al-Ghafir, He is the Forgiver. But He's also Al-Ghafur, He is the All-Forgiver. But He's also Al-Ghaffar, He is the Ever-Forgiver. And that each one of these meanings conveys the meaning of forgiveness, but each one of them is slightly different. So what Imam Ghazali says about this is, he says that Al-Ghafir is the one who indicates the basis of forgiveness. He's the forgiver. So he forgives sins. And we leave it at that. It's the basis of forgiveness. That he says that Al-Ghafur, the all-forgiver, is the one that forgives all sins. So that it might be that, that you have someone that, in, even in the human sense, will forgive you for something that you do wrong, but there's certain things that's unforgivable. No. I'm not going to forgive you for that particular thing. Right? But there's, in terms of our Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he forgives all sins. And then when we talk about that shirk being the only unforgivable sin, that's after death. That as long as we're still alive, that there's no sin that's too great to be forgiven. And in fact, that if no matter what you've done in your past, that if you think that you've done something too great to be forgiven, you've had bad adab and you've been disrespectful to your Lord. Because you don't recognize, you're not recognized, he is al-ghafur. He will forgive every sin. Or someone to have committed every single possible sin that you could possibly commit, that Allah Ta'ala could forgive all of that. And in fact, that he could, if your repentance was sincere, he could change all of those past sins into good deeds. That he is Qadr ala kulli shay, he is al ghafur But he's also al ghafar the ever-forgiver. Right? Meaning that even were someone to, f- to sin time and time and time again, 
whether they be small sins or major sins, he is al ghafar He is the one that forgives time and time and time again. So you'll find that even though all of these, these three words are lexically related, they're all linguistically related, at the same time, they all convey the general meaning of forgiveness, but they're all nuanced in a slight way as well. And he says that, that this is by way of example, and then with all of the other 99 names, it's the same. Even though that they might appear to be similar, that they're slightly different according to one from one perspective. And this is what we're going to be doing. And that, as we mentioned yesterday, uh, that we're going to be grouping some of the names together and then showing some of those nuances so, so this can become clear. And that he mentions uh, other examples of that, but for now, you know, that will, you know, that will suffice. Um, the next discussion that he, he embarks upon is, is it possible for one name to have multiple meanings? Now, this is, the first chapters are very of a scholarly nature, and they're a bit difficult to understand, so that we'll try to uh, simplify it. That you have, in the science of usul, what is called a lafz mushtarak, okay, which is an equivocal term, meaning that you have a word that can have multiple meanings. So, for instance, in the Arabic language, the word yad, hand can have 16 meanings that the word I, ayn, which is the word that we use for eye it could actually refer to your physical eye that it could also refer to a spring like an ayn, like a spring that comes from the earth and other things as well so that that this is a legal discussion is that when related to a word that is a laf mushtarak it is an equivocal term is that to to what extent do all of the range of linguistic possibilities that play themselves out. Now, he speaks about this, that that's an issue of, his, of legal theory, but he speaks about it in the context of the, of the 99 names. Is that obviously that if one word has multiple meanings, and one of those meanings is, contradicts something that we know from scripture, from the sacred law, from the Quran and the Sunnah, then we eliminate the linguistic possibility. But let's say that after that, there's other possibilities that are left. Do we say that this name refers to these different possibilities? Or do we just do ijtihad and use personal reason and, and use reason to try to determine what is the most likely meaning? That the scholars differ on this. And so you will find in some of the books where they'll mention multiple meanings for one word. And it's for this reason why, if you haven't yet noticed, if you might go online, that you'll find different words are translated, different names of Allah are translated in different ways. Even in the, in, in the books that you have there, is that they'll mention one, two, sometimes three different names for the different attributes. And it's for this reason, because there actually is difference on this particular topic. Some say is that they have multiple meanings. The opinion of Imam Ghazali is that no is that, that, you know, each name only has one single meaning. And that he doesn't go into detail about whether the other secondary or third place meanings, that there are other names that convey those meanings. He leaves it at that. But he, what he, so what he does, and it's, you know, throughout his commentary, that he doesn't mention multiple meanings except maybe once or twice. You know, throughout the entire book. And an example that he gives of this is, is the name of Allah Ta'ala, Al-Mu'min. Al-Mu'min. Right, so when we think of Mu'min in the thick, in, in this, when it relates to human beings, you think of a Mu'min, you think of a believer, someone that has Iman. But the name Mu'min, that it could be related to Tasdiq, it could be related to belief, Meaning that Allah Ta'ala in this sense is not that he's a believer, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We wouldn't attribute that to Allah. But we would say that he is the giver of belief. So the mu'min in this sense pertains to Allah Ta'ala is that he's the giver of iman, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you could also say that the, the word aman is security. And so that Allah Ta'ala is the mu'min in the sense that he is the source of security. Or he is the giver of of security and all of the asbab and means for security, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, this is one example and you can mention a number of others. So again, the approach of Imam Ghazali is, is that, that 
he eliminates synonyms as being a possibility. And he says that each, what we have to say is, even if we're saying in a probabilistic way, we're not saying anything definitive, that he's saying that each name only has one apparent meaning. Then there's one last chapter that we wanted to summarize, which is a bit long, but it's, it's very important because it pertains to the heart of this topic and the most important aspect of this topic. And all of the benefits in, of studying the 99 names of Allah Ta'ala, that this is the greatest. And it's Imam Zadi's chapter that he titles, Explaining how the perfection and happiness of man consists in conforming to the perfections of God Most High, and adorning himself with the meanings of his attributes and names insofar as this is conceivable for man. That, at first, appears to be something a bit abstruse, but difficult to understand. That I thought that we asserted the utter transcendence of God. So how are you telling me now that you're going to conform the way that it's translated here to the perfections of God? Perfections is the way he translates here, traits. And that there is a hadith that says, تَخَلُّكُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ Okay, so that we... The akhlaq, which is the plural of khuluq, is a trait or quality. So Allah Ta'ala has traits, that he has qualities. Even though that some of these words that we use in a theological sense or even a philosophical sense, that if we're just used to kind of, you know, TV language, you think of quality, you think of like a product, like the quality of a product. You know, just as if you hear the word accident when we were talking about a'rad wa jawahar yesterday, that an accident is a philosophical term for an attribute. Right? And so that you hear these words and some, the first thing that comes to your mind is something else. But this is why that, you know, we should really you know, try to discover even the wonders of English. English is an amazing language, even though it's been dumbed down and continues to be dumbed down. And that nowadays that people speak in code and um, BTW and, and the LOL and so forth and so on. And that, you know, the, the point is, though, is that, that we, we should try to strengthen and even some of the, I know people that are very righteous and and that they do a weird every day of reading good English literature to strengthen their, the English language. And because this is the medium through which that we are, you know, speaking oftentimes that we should strive to, you know, speak language, you know, well. And that there's a wisdom in that that Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مَنْ رَسُولًا إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ That we didn't send a messenger except with the lisan, with the tongue of his people, in order to clarify to them. And that applies to language just as much as it applies to contextualizing the teachings to the mindset of that particular time. So it's a comprehensive understanding, it's not just language. But language is an important you know, aspect of that. Allah Ta'ala has qualities, that he has attributes, he has traits, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we're saying that from one standpoint, we assert the utter transcendence of Allah. One of the 13 necessary attributes that Dr. Omar taught us was that he's dissimilarity, he's mukhalif li khalqi. He's absolutely different from his creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that this is the purpose, this is what the theologian does, is that he preserves the transcendence of our Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, that there is a way that the human being can reflect imperfectly in a limited matter that the names of God, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that in different ways. And this is what exactly what Imam Ghazali does, is because that he'll go through all 99 names, and after each name is that he'll mention the share, his counsel, what is the share or the portion that we can have of that particular name. What we understand there then is that that we've already eliminated that, that Allah Ta'ala does not exist within time and space. He's not coming into you. We don't believe in incarnation. We don't believe in any anthropomorphic understandings. We don't believe is that there's yani, any type of halul or ittihad. That we don't believe that, that, that Allah Ta'ala will enter into you in any way. And that human beings do not become... God-like in that sense that they become divine. No, we're human beings, but that we have an ability to reflect, albeit in an imperfect way, 
that attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that in the ethical theory of Imam Ghazali, when he talks about the philosophical ethics as well as the mystical virtues, is that what he says is, is that every trait that we take on is a door that opens up of proximity to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. So good character, that it it's not only, according to our understanding of itself, about bringing about some type of result in the world, that having good character traits directly corresponds to a very deep metaphysical meaning of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that every trait of character is a door that opens up for a more intimate and proximate relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that, that uh, having said that, many of the names that are actually quite obvious, that if we say that Allah is ar-Rahman, which we'll be talking about, that we can inculcate mercy. And there's a different type of mercy that we inculcate as a reflection of our Rahman, as opposed to the mercy that we inculcate uh, as a reflection of our Rahim. Names like Al Karim, the generous, that's obvious to the ways that human beings can inculcate something of that sort. Then there's others that are a bit more difficult. Some of the names of rigor, like Allah, right, the one who brings about harm, or Al Qabid, the constrictor. How do those names apply? That generally speaking, the, the more majestic or rigorous names apply to the human being's own self. They're not names that you exert outwardly towards people. Yeah, outwardly, we're not supposed to be harmful. We're supposed to reflect the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nafi, the beneficial. But that there's internal tendencies that we can have that these many of the majestic names apply to our lower soul or apply to the various internal enemies of the human being. And that we'll be discussing that inshallah ta'ala. So when we talk about closeness and we talk about the perfection of human beings is in this, that it's a closeness in terms of traits. It's not a closeness in terms of any spatial sense. And that he's going to expand upon this, you know, shortly. Now I wanted to quote here a few passages that he says that indeed those who have drawn near to him share in the meanings of the names of God the Most High in a threefold way. Okay, so he's going to mention a tripartite breakdown here. The first is a knowledge of these meanings by way of witnessing and unveiling so that their essential realities are clarified for them by a proof which does not permit any error. This is one of the great contributions of Imam Zadi is that he indicated to us that there is a knowledge that exists, a knowledge that comes through unveiling, that is absolutely certain. We can have absolute certitude about it. There is no possibility of its error. But this is a knowledge that is experienced. And so he's saying that there are some people that what is referred to the lifting of the veil, which is something that's important for us to understand conceptually. Because that if we deny that it's even a possibility, that there's no hope for us to ever have that happen to us. But if we understand that this can happen conceptually, then we can take the necessary steps to expose ourselves to the mercy of Allah Ta'ala to actually have that process take place within us. So this is the first, is that through witnessing and unveiling that someone starts to witness the names of Allah, al Latif manifesting witness the names of Allah Al-Muntaqim manifesting and so forth and so on. And that there's people that are like that. And these are what are called the Arifin. And if you notice, is that the terminology when we describe the righteous, that it's always terminology of Adab. We call them Arif Billah. That we call them an Arif, a Gnostic, but Billah means through Allah. Meaning it's taking something away from them. Then we talk about some of the gifts that they receive to Allah, right? We call them waridat. A warid is a comer, someone that comes to visit you, right? Meaning that these spiritual visitations that come to them, these meanings that come to their heart, implying that there's nothing that they're doing. It's coming to them solely from the grace of Allah Taala. It's not about them anymore, and uh, and so forth and so on. But there are people that are like this, and in, in if you've ever been around them, that you will know is that you'll be in certain situations and they will literally intuit what is the name manifesting that situation and they'll respond accordingly. And 
that they will associate various phenomena that are happening around them to the names of, of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. A second way, he says, of sharing in these meanings belongs to those who so highly esteem what is disclosed to them of the attributes of majesty that their high regard releases a longing to possess this attribute in every way possible to them so that they may go closer to the truth in quality, not in place. Meaning that they're not at the degree where there's a witnessing and unveiling yet, but their understanding has become so proud, pro profound that it's... In, it's led to a deep sense of longing within them to continue on in whatever it is that they're doing so that they can attain the third and highest level. That he then takes a tangent and says, no one will lack this longing, meaning a longing to be close to Allah Ta'ala by means of reflecting his attributes, except for one or two reasons. Either from inadequate knowledge and certainty, that the attribute in question is one of the attributes of majesty and perfection, or from the fact that one's heart is filled with another longing and absorbed by it. And that if we pause here to think about this for a minute, that we'll hear oftentimes people will speak about ma'rifa, they'll speak about knowledge of God, and this is the purpose of creation, and so forth and so on. And that it oftentimes we'll have a, we'll find a sense of dryness in our hearts related to that that what we, we often will question, like, what does that mean? And I don't understand. Ma'rifa, what are you talking about? That all I know is that I'm veiled and that, you know, I have these certain feelings in my heart, sometimes this, sometimes that, and we know our own states, right? But that, that Imam Ghazali is telling us that, that, you know, that natural state in and of itself is as a result because our heart's been filled with other preoccupations is that if you put in the time and take it seriously and start detaching and overcoming that, that it will start opening up to you what is what is naturally going to come when that takes place. And so meaning that, that if that's the case, is that what we're required to do is place spiritual struggle in to expose ourselves to the necessary result were we to do that. The third share follows upon the effort to require whatever is possible of those attributes to imitate them and be adorned with their good qualities. For in this way that man becomes Rabbani, completely devoted, devoted to the Lord, that is close to the Lord Most High, and becomes a companion to the heavenly host, al for they are on the carpet of proximity to God. And so meaning that according to the understanding of Mamuzadi is that in this tripartite breakdown, this is the first stage, is that we not only memorize the names, not only do we learn their meanings, is that we implement their counsel, is that how each one of these names pertains. And then if you do that, that it will lead to the second chair. And if you do that, it will lead to the first and the highest. Okay. He says... A number of other things here, but another passage that we wanted to quote is as follows. He goes on to discuss the knowledge of God. And he says, and since there is no likeness of him, he or his nature is not known by other than him. So El Junaid, may God's mercy be upon him, was right when he remarked, only God knows God. So again, he's touching on this topic that when we say that we can know God, how do you reconcile that with what other people have said is that only God knows God and no one can truly know God except God. So he's going to reconcile this. And that you have other Gnostics that said, when they're on the brink of death, what do you long for? And he said, that I might see him before I die, be it only for an instant, yani with the eye of the heart. That, so Imam Lazadi is saying, if one were to say that I know, I know only God, he would be right. And if he said, I do not know God, he would also be correct. That just as that uh, someone would say that, do you know Abu Bakr al-Siddiq? And we would all say, yes, we all know Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. But do you know Abu Bakr al-Siddiq? No, I don't know Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. So it depends upon how you just define it. And in a similar sense, this is why we say that we understand prophecy meaning that as a concept that it's possible to exist, and that it does exist, in fact. But at the same time that we say is that only a prophet knows the true nature of prophecy. Right? We don't know the true nature of prophecy. 
And it's for this reason some of the scholars said is that when Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam comes in the end of time, that because he shares with Sayyidina Muhammad Nubuwa wa Risala, that prophecy and messengership is that he will be able to speak about the Prophet Sallallahu in ways that no one in the Prophet's Ummah is able to. Because he shares something with Rasulullah Sallallahu that no one else in the Ummah shares with him, meaning prophecy and messengership. So both of these statements are true at the same time. And the way that you understand them is, is that you say that no one truly knows God except God. But from the blessing of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, that he's, been, he's given us a limited ability to know him. And in that limited ability and what we're able to know him, that when we're talking now in the realm of the intellect and theology, is that what you say is it's the greatest thing that a human being can possibly experience. As for its true nature, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's something that can't be expressed on the tongue. And it can be pointed to. And this is what those who have experience do, is that they say, this is what you have to do to attain it. Follow the steps, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. It will lead you to this reality that I'm experiencing, but I'm experiencing something that I can't tell you exactly what it is. Just as if you've never tasted honey, you try to describe to someone what honey tastes like, you can't. Even if you would say, well, it, you know, you, know if you, it, you can't ever explain it to someone until they actually taste it. You can just point to it. Right? And the Labib, the intelligent person, is the one who understands the Nishara. That he understands indications and illusions and that they will, they will move towards that. Okay? So that, that both, in, in fact, are true. So he does say here, you may say, since it is inconceivable to know him, how can the ranks of angels, prophets, and, whole, and righteous people be said to differ in knowing him? And that he goes on to explain now a, a uh, he goes on to explain the way that is possible. And that even though that no one truly knows God except God, that there are various degrees of our knowledge of God. And that they're related to the various things that can be known. And the example that he gives us is that if you take someone like Imam al-Shafi'i, that his greatest student, Imam al-Muzani, that who was one of the great transmitters of his school, that he knew Imam al-Shafi'i. Imam al-Shafi'i's porter, the person, his servant in his home, also knew Imam al-Shafi'i. But what is the knowledge of Imam al-Muzani, of Imam al-Shafi'i, compared to Imam al-Shafi'i's porter? That Imam, the Imam al-Muzani knew the details of Imam al-Shafi'i, his position on A, B, and C. And so meaning because the scope of what he knew about Imam al-Shafi'i expanded, that his knowledge of Imam al-Shafi'i increased, and thus he was more proximate to him than, let's say, his porter, who might have also known him, but to a certain capacity. That likewise, that those people who come to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the degree that they understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, that is to the extent that they actually know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we don't restrict that to the phenomenal world. And that even though some people will question what I'll mention now, at the same time that it's important that we have religious maturity and that we, we break out of some of these chains that are really limiting us. And I would argue, especially in our time, the onslaught of many of the philosophical and scientific currents in the modern world is that if we don't have the ability to at least think in this way, that it's very difficult for us to maintain and to fully categorize and understand all of these various uh, ways of interpreting the world. And what I'm, what I'm essentially trying to get at is, is that, that, that what can be known, we don't restrict it to the realm of the senses nor do we restrict it to the realm of the intellect. And in fact, that you have, as some have said, is that everything that rate relates to the realm of the sensory, that it's very insignificant related to the realm of the psyche. Everything that's related to the realm of the psyche is very insignificant related to the realm of that which is even beyond the psyche. Meaning that you have successive worlds of incredible distances. In Wahhab ibn Munabbah said about Allah Ta'ala saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, that he said that Allah Ta'ala created 17,000 worlds. The dunya and the akhir are two of them. Like, what are the other 16,998? 
that Allah Ta'ala has created. What are the other dimensions? We affirm that the earth exists. We affirm that there's seven heavens. طيب, what exists in the seven heavens? And Allah Ta'ala says, وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الحبك, That the heavens and its pathways. Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, he said, this is a statement that is narrated by him. I know the pathways of heaven better than I know the pathways of this earth. Meaning that, that, that it's for us to think that it's inconceivable for a human being to extend beyond the material world, that we're, we're really limiting ourselves in that. And we're really limiting ourselves in a religious sense as well. And that it's just really interesting to me that in a time of, of such late materials in that we live in, is that also you have the religious response to that, which is very materialist at the same time. Is that, that limiting people to, you know, what, what it is that we can sense and what it is is that, that we can come to the conclusion with with our intellects. And meaning that in terms of everything that exists, Allah Ta'ala has told us in the Quran and the teachings of our Prophet what we need to know. And so when we talk about the five stages of existence, the first was the pre-earthly realm. And we know that there was a reality to the pre-earthly realm. But most of the pre-earthly realm, we don't know what, what happened. We know what we need to know. The day of to be Rabbikum. Right? We know that Allah Ta'ala took an ahad. He took a covenant with the previous prophets and messengers. That were the prophet to come, that they would believe in him and give him victory. Absolutely. That we know a little bit about Adam and being in the loins. But from the time that we are born and everything that happened before that, that we know a little bit, but not much compared to everything that happened. That what do we really know? That about from the beginning of the world until the crown of creation, the human being, that came to the world. We actually know very little compared to if the real world really is 14 billion years old. So my point of this is, is that, that, that we've, we really limit ourselves in thinking that oftentimes that not expanding the horizons of our mind to really start to think what is, you know, what could exist outside the realm of what we're able to come to know with our senses or with our mind. And even if you think about these words that we have, like the arsh, the throne, what is the throne? What is the throne? What is the reality of the throne? What is the reality of the kursi, the footstool? What is the reality of the seven heavens? What is the reality of what's in the seven heavens? And the expansiveness of them and so forth and so on. And the point is in this context is that, that the more knowledge that we have of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, which is a manifestation of his names and attributes subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more proximal we'll be to him because the, the, the more that we will know. Okay, just as the Imam al Muzani, who knew more, many more details about Imam Shafi's life and his positions and the way that his mind worked, obviously is closer to Imam Shafi than his porter. And it is, it is this in and of itself that points to that what he says here, finally, similarly, you should understand that creatures different, you know, human beings differ in knowledge of God the Most High in proportion to what is revealed to them, you know, unveiled to them from the things known of God, great and glorious, the marvels of his power and the wonders of his signs in this world and the next, and in the visible and invisible world. And uh, that that's essentially, you know, what he says there, and that he, he, he takes a... Uh, takes another tangent and that as he usually does is that when he starts to point to the ilum and mukashifa, the science is unveiling, he stops. So he says, let us pull back the reins of discourse right here, for we have plunged into the depth of a shoreless sea. And secrets like these ought not be abused by putting them down in books. And since this was not intended but has happened by accident, let us refrain from it and return to explaining in detail the meanings of the beautiful names of God. So uh, th that's essentially, in a very summarized fashion, what, what he says there. That as of tomorrow, or actually tonight, we'll, we'll be going through the, the attributes as listed in Surah Al-Hashr. And then after that, we're going to uh, move to the Imam Ghazali's division of the names into 10 categories. And that, that he, he does this uh, in order to you know, classify and, and to, for us to be able to categorize them which this is a very effective tool. This is one way of doing this. You know, just as that if you want to talk about the themes of the Quran, 
so that there's different categories that you can give. For instance, Ibn Juzayd Kalbi, he gives seven, seven major themes of the Qur'an. That Imam Ghazali, which I think that you're doing in your Qur'an study group, and the, the, the jewels of the Qur'an, uh, that he also gives different categories through which we can classify the various verses. And, and the reason that's helpful is because it helps with tadabbur. That if you, if you take, for instance, Imam Ghazali's book on the 99 names, and that you go through and try to categorize the ones that are not mentioned here. And you try to understand why the, he put these in these various categories. Because this is exactly the, the division of the ten names. The names that you see there are exactly as you will find in his book, as is on page 159 to 161 uh, in, in the translation. So I, I just listed that without his, his commentary, but uh, and what he says about that. So uh, we'll be going over that. So.